Hello everyone and welcome to the after show for the Lindoris Abbey Rapid Challenge, uh, the second event of the Magnus Store. We had our first day of action today uh, featuring uh, Magnus Carlson again, Hikaru Nakamura who was in, uh, who were the two finalists, uh, but also a lot of new faces which were, were great to see. Uh, we saw Ali Reza is back for this event as well. And uh, we are extremely happy that we have announced that this this event, uh, which started after you know sort of the the brainchild of the the situation, uh, the difficult situation we found ourselves in with the pandemic, uh, is the Magnus Store, which provides uh, incredible high level chess online uh, for the first time in such a setting for high you know incredibly high prizes uh, and incredibly high level chess. Pretty much all of the top players in the world playing in a tour. And um, this is the second event. This one, is, we are partnering with the uh, Lindoris Abbey Heritage Foundation, which I encourage you to, to look up. Uh, it's uh, an incredible abbey uh, that was built, I believe, in the 12th century. I still have to go through some of my history because, frankly, there was so much chess today. And I was just hosting the, uh, the banter, which is always fun, with uh, Grandmaster David Howell that I... Uh, I haven't had you know the, the the time to do the entire my entire research on the Abbey, but it looks it looks certainly very interesting, and we are happy to have them as a partner for this event. Um, they had organized some other chess uh, tournaments that you may have seen before, like the Chess Stars series, I believe, uh, in the past. So, um, without further ado, we're going to do things a little bit differently for for this uh, particular event since the. Uh, the Heritage Foundation, and we, we have the hashtag uh, Heritage Chess you may have seen around, uh, it has certainly a historical perspective uh, on things. So we are publishing these uh, very interesting articles on Chess24 uh, on each of the player and their background, how they got to be where they are, the chess traditions of their country. And the first article was published, I think, yesterday, uh, and is about Daniel Dubov, one of the most uh, promising uh, players in the world, uh, for sure, and uh, talks about his childhood. So in every after show, we're going to try to go through one of these articles, one of the players, and give you a little bit of background on each of these players. Uh, but I did want, first, first, I guess I'll start by just showing the, uh, showing the standings for today. Um, the... Top two players, as you see at the top of the standings here, Kao Nakamura, Magnus Carlsen, uh, were players that did extremely well in the first event of the tour. Karyakin and Wesley So, who joined them at the top, had solid days as well. Um, although we'll see that Karyakin had one um, sort of uh, fortunate moment where he got to checkmate his opponent. We'll, uh, we'll go through that. Um, but... Uh, you know, it's, it's just the beginning. Um, to, to give you a little bit of an idea, the top eight players after this single round robin, so eight out of 12, will qualify for a knockout tournament. So they're playing um, over three days the round robin, then they're going to get to the knockout phase and, and start, playing, uh, start playing matches. Um, so um, it was actually a, a tough day for Daniel Dubov uh, as our fe featured player with his article, uh, the article, an, an interesting one. I, you know, uh, urge you to read it on Chess24. Uh, it's, it's, it's really well done. Um, but the, he, he, he struggled today, um, you know, after having had a, a, a good performance in the Steinitz Bliss tournament today, he just couldn't quite get going. Um, but I will speak a little bit about uh, Daniel and let me go back here. Um, so I did want to speak a little bit about him. So first of all, he, uh, he is a player who came, uh, he was born in Moscow. He is now 24 years old. So he was born in, uh, what does that make it? Uh, 1996. And um, he uh, was born to a chess family. So his, uh, his father, uh, his father and his grandfather were in the chess world. I think his grandfather was a, a well-known arbiter and a, a well-known figure in the chess world. And he, he, it, he's actually very humble about his beginnings and, and says that he, you know, he feels like there were some young players who were even more talented than he was, but he was fortunate to have the support of a family that liked chess and that uh, living in Moscow compared, for example, to living in some of the regions. He speaks of a player who lived in, in Alista, which is in Kalmykia, a semi-autonomous semi republic in Russia. Uh, but that he, the opportunities that he was afforded by being in Moscow and having uh, family in chess 
were were extremely beneficial to his growth as a chess player. Um, and this reminds me a little bit of tennis, where in tennis it seems like a lot of the a lot of the very top players had the good fortune of having a parent who was either a, a tennis pro or a tennis coach, and that that makes it uh, possible to to do it without you know investing a, an absolute fortune. Uh, in chess, you don't see that quite as much, I would say, but but it is interesting that you see it in the case of Daniel Dubov. Um, and so his upbringing, he describes it as having had. Uh, a bit more of a Soviet chess school background. And that's something that is probably um, likely to, you know, disappear in the computer age, right? So he considers that he had more of a classical upbringing uh, in that, you know, he he has studied the classics. He studied with some very well-known Russian coaches like uh, Sergei Shipov, uh, Dolmatov. And then more recently, as he got to be very strong, he speaks about studying with two players that are vastly different in style in Boris Gelfand, uh, you know, former Soviet champion, extremely strong player who's played for Israel for a long time, uh, and Alexander Morozevich, uh, Sasha Morozevich, who is a extremely creative, um, really dangerous player who just hasn't played as much in the last few years. But, uh, but those two coaches would be almost diametrically opposed if you're looking at two um, two coaches in chess that are that are different those two guys are, are pretty much it um, but Dubov uh, has sort of found himself to be a, a player of, of it's, a, it's a hard style to describe um, he's known to be a very good opening theoretician and I don't know if it was because of that but you know it's well known that he was on, on Magnus's team uh, for the previous world championship um, and he generally has um, spoken about spoken about very highly in terms of his opening knowledge. And I did want to show you a game that's not from today, but I'm just going to go through this one game, which is famous. So you may have seen this if, if you know uh, Dubov well. Um, but this game is one where he plays. So this is a position that's happened thousands and thousands of times. Um, and normally black plays either rook b8 or b4 or bishop b7, right? The moves that defend the b pawn. And here Dubov plays this hybrid marshal, which had never ever been played. And um, the computer uh, initially does not like this move. So in order to, to, to actually um, look at this and be like, this is interesting, you have to move past the fact that the evaluation looks like it's not very good. Um, and it looks... It looks like it's unlikely to work, right? You're you're letting the B pawn be taken. Um, you're letting the D pawn be taken. It's it seems like it's just going to be a bad martial gambit, um, and yet he makes it work. And so he clearly looked at and and so there's there's a lot of possibilities here, where, and there have been since Dubov played this was a novelty played I think a couple of years ago. Uh, now it's been played a couple dozen times, and it's you know it, it's maybe not incredible for Black, but it's certainly very interesting and in this game he goes on to destroy his opponent um i'm just gonna sort of walk you through the moves um this position i think after deeper analysis it was found that white could hold a draw um but look at this so he plays bishop takes f2 king takes queen d4 bishop e3 knight g4 and so the king starts walking and this position when i first saw the game um it seemed to me like it, it it was unlikely to work for black because I just thought all he has, the only piece that he's got out is the queen. Um, of course, he's going to get a rook in the game, but it just seems like it might not be enough to checkmate, right? It doesn't have any miter pieces left. White is only one move from complete consolidation, right? Like um, so, uh, but after rookie eight, this position is actually really bad, uh, really, really bad for white already. Um, and white sort of lost without a fight here, but there was not there was not an easy way. So for example, like I think the main lines would have gone like this. The rook lifts to e6, come to f6. Um, but to evaluate bishop takes f2 is correct, because I don't think it was preparation at that point, um, was very impressive. And uh, his opponent played rook e2, and then um, Dubov found this very nice idea with g5, which threatens the very strong checkmate here. And, uh, and he won this game in just a few more moves. So that's my little preview of Daniel Dubov. Uh, 
he's someone who also this is in the article as well he doesn't shy away from from giving some uh political opinions he's a he's, he's an outspoken guy I, I did have a fun interview with him uh when he did the steinitz memorial when he played in the steinitz memorial a couple of days ago um and yeah so he's definitely uh definitely an interesting guy and this is a great game you know if you're interested uh take a look at it there are a lot more games of daniel dubov that are uh, worth seeing so take a look at you know you can check it out even on chess 24 there is a database feature and so you can see pretty much uh any game so um that being said, uh, we are now going to um, move to the games from the tournament. And um, I wanted to start start with the, the first game. So uh, I'm, the way I'm structuring this today is we're going to have sort of the top five moments as I, as I chose them. And there were actually a lot of candidates today. So if you disagree with my choices for what the top five moments were, then, uh, you know, uh, let me know, but that's no, that's no, uh, I am trying my best, um, but here we go. So the first one was actually the game between Magnus Carlsen and Grischuk. I want to take you to uh, its move. It goes quite a, it's quite a bit further, but there is one key moment that I thought was, uh, was amazing. This looked like a good opening for Magnus, by the way. It looked like um, um, something went wrong for black in that white kind of got everything they wanted in terms of the, the king side pressure. Uh, without black having had a chance to get too much counterplay yet, but it does get to be fairly complicated uh, very quickly here. And so in this position, so this is the position I want to look at. And if you're looking at it with the computer, you know, try not to because the computer the computer warps your warps your brain. But in this position, uh, black has a very concrete threat of playing bishop c6, attacking the knight. Black also has a very uh, concrete threat or at least idea of playing knight d4 with the idea that the queen attacks the pawn on a2, which can threaten check or, and also threaten the knight. So there are some, some real, um, there are some real threats here for black. And even though white seems to be just a few moves away, you know, from crashing through with like, let's say rook g1 and g5, um, this position is a very critical position. And here, uh, Magnus, finds the correct variation. And if you're looking at it with the computer, computer gives this position as much better for white. But um, to me and to a few people who are quite strong that I spoke to, it was not obvious at all. And so he plays h6, and this is a really key move. Uh, and after g6, knight g7, so he's forcing, um, he's forcing the pawn to g7. But this, you know, this position did not look incredibly clear. It looks like the pawn on g7 is going to fall and it doesn't seem um it doesn't seem to at least to my eyes it didn't seem clear that white was going to have much of anything uh, but in reality the black position is almost on the verge of collapsing when you go through a few moves and everything here is more or less forced he goes knight c5 the knights get traded he plays a5 to defend this uh I'm sorry to defend the pawn on b4 i did want to mention that if taking on a2 uh, is something else that you have to assess correctly while going into this. Uh, it does turn out that this move is very, very strong. There's a few ideas here. One of the ideas is that you can th often be threatening to play rook takes h7 uh, with the idea of playing rook h1 and rook h8 mate. Um, so that's one of the one of the ideas. And this position, even though black has some, some checks, they're not actually that scary because even if the pawn was on b3, the king can actually run to d2 and it's only one check. So um so yeah i mean this evaluating this position though from playing h6 i thought was really impressive and i'll just walk you through the end of the game after a5 here uh but black basically didn't have much of a chance here uh he decided so bishop f8 introduces the idea of rook h7 maybe not right away uh but it's definitely in the air there's also the idea of just playing something like queen h3 so he gives the exchange um and Neither player had much time, but it looks like Magnus uh, kept things in control. And here, um, yeah, here he just uh, eventually checkmated essentially black. Um, so uh, this was the first moment of the day for me, which I thought was, uh, you know, an, an impressive start for Magnus. Uh, and other game that was really interesting was this game between, uh, this is also round one, I believe. Uh, this is a game between Wesley So and Wei Yi. And Wesley So had a good day, right? He's one of our one of our leaders here, and um, yeah, I thought this uh, 
this position was interesting because it doesn't look like black is doing too badly here. Um, in fact, probably black is not doing too badly, but very quickly here things go wrong. And so it seems like he chose the, the wrong, um, black sort of has to decide, am I gonna try to play D5, allow the center to be, center to be locked up like this, or am I gonna try to play C5 uh, and try to to bust to bust uh, bust the d4 pawn open, right? And so um, black played d5, and the thing is, I think positionally this was a correct decision, but tactically it fails. So he goes knight h7, and he's got a very concrete plan here that looks very strong. He wants to play queen h4, that's going to attack these two pawns, and then he wants to play either knight g5 or knight f4, and suddenly it looks like um, the white the white king could actually be in some real trouble. But Wesley, Wesley here had very, very correctly assessed that this position is actually very good for white. And the, the sequence here I thought was kind of amazing. He goes f4. So this is a very natural move, but you have to, because you want to play f5, it, you know, if, if you're allowed to, it, this is great. Or even if you can play, um, you know, just bishop e3, king g2, if you can just consolidate, the position is amazing. But black has this. And so now the question is, what does white do? And... Uh, you're threatening two pawn here, f4 and h3. And they're important pawns. Um, you know, things can really collapse quickly um, here. But he had uh, seen this idea, which I thought was very impressive. He goes knight to f5. By the way, queen to g4 is not so great because the pawn on d4 is going to hang. Um, so, so he plays knight to f5. And this idea is, 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 is really cool, I thought. And in, the idea involves that the queen is going to be misplaced on h3 because after bishop c2 which defends the knight white has this amazing rook lift idea uh, and the position turns out to be really difficult for black um, so i thought this idea and, and the queen is actually in in severe danger here um, so the rest we'll go through the rest of the game quickly but um basically white has now a huge uh huge position in return for for a pawn um, there was one sort of moment here where uh, Wesley actually sort of gave up some of his advantage by playing queen takes h6, but it's understandable with, uh, you know, the clock ticking, these games are never going to be perfect. Um, it actually allowed rook takes e5 here, which now leads to just a mess. It's, it's still fine for white, but um, that pawn, that rook can't be taken because the rook f2 takes c2 and things are just uh, sort of flipping in black's favor there. Um, so queen takes h6 was an inaccurate move, um, but after rook f7, he got everything back on track, bishop b3, uh, and after that, black didn't have any chances. Um, so uh, that was my moment number two. Uh, moment number three is in the game between Hikaru and um, Ali Reza, and this one is just more, it's more just, it shows, it shows the strength of Hikaru in these somewhat innocuous positions and you have to be really careful against them. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I think people still sort of underestimate his uh, attacking ability sometimes. And so here, um, this looks like a, a, f a relatively normal position that should be, should be okay for black. It's, but it's, these positions are actually very rich for both sides where you can change the pawn structure. Both sides can, can choose sort of when to take or when not to take. Um, and so those positions end up being quite fluid in terms of, of what can happen. And Ali Reza goes a5, and I think maybe this plan was a little bit too slow. Maybe he should have prepared um, prepared to do something on the king side. Because here it can be a little bit annoying, and this is a typical idea. Um, white will have ideas like bishop f6 with either the pawn on h7 or the pawn on c5 potentially hanging. Um, of course, I'm sure Ali Reza has seen this kind of thing before. He wanted to play a4 and probably thought that here he had reasonable counterplay. Um, turns out that the position is actually quite difficult. Um, but now look at what happens after queen b6. So by the way, c c4 is met by bishop takes c4. It's not the end of the variation. You can still look at this. Um, it's a bit complicated, uh, but uh, queen b6, the idea of the move is to threaten c4 because there's no longer a pin on the d-file. So um, now uh, Hikaru, but now Hikaru punishes him for, 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 this, uh, for this move. He plays bishop f6, gf, bishop h7, 
King H8. <clears throat> and now I think Ali Reza must have thought that he that the pressure on on A3, which would attack the knight, um, and maybe the opportunity to play somewhere D4, that he would have counterplay. Um, but after Hikaru's move, which is an extremely strong, very precise knight h4, um, he's basically completely lost already. Uh, the problem is that the king ends up in a mating net. There's ideas like knight f5, which is going to be played in the game with queen a2, queen h... Whoops, my arrow is wrong. Uh, queen e2, queen to h5. Uh, there's ideas with rook takes d5, rook h5. Knight h4 is just incredibly precise. And I don't think that's an easy move to... Um, it's not an easy move to spot, in my opinion. Um, and the rest of the game is just a few moves. But uh, the mating net is woven, and there's really not much that uh, that Ali Reza can do. Um, so, um, you know, just a, a very, very quick uh, victory for, for Hikaru. And if we go back to, I want to look at the, the standings again. Um, this was a, a tough day again for Ali Reza, who's been struggling a little bit in these... Uh, and these tour events so far and it will be interesting to see if he picks it up and you know people people have said sometimes well this time control is slower than three minutes and that's true but keep in mind that Ali Reza has done extremely well in rapid in the past and so I think uh, he could very easily bounce back and surprise people so we will see um, all right going back here okay um, so my next my next moment um, my next moment, well, is actually a, a, uh, a very, uh, a very simple, a very simple one. Uh, but it was in, in, in this position where white was trying to win and had reasonable winning chances. It is almost unthinkable for this to occur. And so I feel like in any top five, top 10, it has to make it because it's, it's so rare that 2700s. Uh, get checkmated sort of as a surprise, right? So in this position, it's not easy for white to win because of that threat in particular. Uh, but here, um, Wei Yi against uh, Karyakin suffers a sort of a, a really uh, disappointing loss. Um, I think he spotted, so I'm sure he spotted that he can't take this pawn because of the fork, right? And so because he saw that, he actually was blind to the to the other idea and this is something that can easily happen to the chess brain, right? You get fixated on, on one threat and you're like, you know what? So I will attack this pawn instead and probably thinks that he's going to get some kind of, you know, rook end game or actually this one wouldn't work. There's rook h5. I'm trying to see what he could have expected here. Probably just the expected knight e5 back and then knight g6, uh, which is probably not actually or even this and rook c4, which is probably not even that bad for black. But imagine the surprise when black plays knight e1. And it's checkmate. Very, very rare to see checkmate on the board. Uh, yeah, checkmate on the board is is very, very rare that it happens as a surprise, right? Like that they didn't see it coming the move before. And so I think just because of that, it is worth uh, it is worth showing. Um, all right. So then, of course, it's not it's not a long it's not a long thing to show. So this moment was a quick one. Uh, I got another one, which is the last sort of fifth. So I, I'm going to try to do these top fives, the fifth uh, moment of the day. Um, and they're not in any particular order, by the way. Um, but this one is a, is a, I'll actually go back a couple of moves here. In this position, Black has sacrificed a pawn, but he had a very, very clever idea here, which is to play b4. And after the knight comes to b5, he plays knight to c4. And suddenly the, the, the white position is actually quite difficult. Um, there's, first of all, a threat against the knight on b5. Uh, the knight also puts pressure against the bishop on d6. But there's also this um, idea that the knight can come to b2. So, for example, if white were to play knight c7, uh, really the, the by far the best move is to play knight b2 and then pick up. We actually pick this up here and then we take this one. Uh, I'm sorry, we take on c7 here, not on d1. Um, there's... The only case where you would take on uh, d1, yeah, so if the queen goes somewhere else, like queen to e2, now we take on d1 because we can move our knight back to c3. Um, so so in this position, after knight c4, it turns out that black is actually better. Uh, and he got this position 
which is very pleasant for black because white has the extra pawn islands here on the queen side versus these guys. Um, so certainly a good uh, a good position for black. Uh, but black but white did manage to hold, and in fact he you know he immediately tries to get rid of get rid of his uh, extra pawn island, and uh, this position is still unpleasant I think, but he he did manage to hold it in this uh, this time control. So that was my last moment of the day, but I also have for you a uh, quick uh, review of the game of the day, which I thought had to be the game between Magnus and Heikaru, just because the they just met. Uh, clearly, a little bit of a speed chess rivalry rivalry uh, happening here, and uh, they've had you know tense moments, and this game was no exception. So they played. Um, Hikaru has been extremely faithful to the the Queen's Gambit decline that he's been playing. Um, in this game, uh, Magnus goes for bishop f4, uh, taking on d5 first though, right? So, which is a little bit different than playing uh, bishop f4 right away, as they've had many games also. Um, and here, um, Magnus lets him go for this bishop f5 plan, which normally is considered to be uh, a pretty solid uh, near equality type structure. Uh, and he plays h4. So h4 is, you know, we always talk about it. Um, the commentators uh, speak about it constantly that now computers, um, especially the, the neural network style engines, love to push their h pawns forward. Um, this is another case. It's not actually too crazy here because um, white has not decided where to put their king. They still could very well castle on the queen side. Uh, and I think the reason Magnus is playing it is that in most of these positions, Black's next move would be to castle kingside. And most of the other moves, you could argue, are suboptimal. Um, so I think with h4, he says, you know, your your best move is to cal castle kingside. Well, go ahead, castle kingside after I played h4. And the, the computer actually thinks that castling is quite possible, but it's certainly interesting to play h4. So Hikaru plays knight b6, which is very reasonable. He's got this... Uh, a normal maneuver, queen c8, queen e6, uh, that he does next, uh, which is reasonable. It's also possible that, that a move like a5, you know, I think um, countering h4 with a5 is always tempting. You you say, uh, you have a rook pawn, I have a rook pawn also. Uh, but in this case, I, I, I really kind of like this move because um, you're, you're basically telling white the same thing. You played h4, are you going to castle here after I played a5? And sh surely uh, white can do this, but it, it gets to be a complicated position, right? Black is going to play this and maybe b5, b4. And so, uh, of course, white can can simply wait. They don't, have to, uh, they don't have to castle. In fact, they might not castle. Maybe they'll even castle short. So this is maybe an idea for another game. But in the game, they play knight b6, knight e5. Knight b6 is almost always going to be met by this knight uh, intrusion. It makes sense. Uh, white has the possibility sometimes to play f3 and g4. Um, but uh, yeah, the knight goes away, we, we jump. So queen c8, castles, queen e6, king b1, knight e4. So knight e4, this is where things start to get really complicated. Uh, knight e4, this is a common tactical idea. If, if the queen takes the pawn, then... Uh, the knight is pinned. This is this is important because this arises in the game as well. So Magnus plays queen to c2. Uh, he's defending the f2 pawn. And if given the chance, I assume um, his knight next move might be to play f3 himself. Um, but Magnus plays bishop b4. Uh, sorry, sorry, not Magnus. Hikaru plays bishop b4. And now if white simply plays f3, now this, this structure is, is an improvement for, for black. Uh, maybe bishop d6 actually. And I think this, you know, is an improvement because the knight is going to have a nice square on c4. Um, and the white king doesn't feel that safe with a pawn on c3. So so Magnus decides to take on e4. And here the position gets really interesting. He plays h5, uh, natural, but it's based on tactics. So it's not just, um, it's not just like, let me push my h pawn and see what happens. Uh, because after g5, uh, there's basically a sacrifice involved. Uh, so he plays bishop takes g5. If he played simply bishop g3, then unfortunately f6 actually traps this knight. No squares, no squares for the knight, right? So, um, so he's forced. He's forced to go for this uh, sacrifice, um, and he plays rook h4. It's actually a sacrifice more of a rook versus two pieces because here the threat of knight g6. Sorry. 
uh, ensures that he gets something back. Castles, knight g6, this is all forced. And so they reach this position. And I thought this was kind of fascinating because if you recall, and I'm just going to switch to another game real quick. When they played in um, they played in the Invitational, this was a key game where Magnus actually uh, and Hikaru had the same sort of material imbalance. Uh, this is a game that Magnus won. It was sort of a key game um, where they had... Magnus had a rook and two pawns versus two pieces. And so in this game, uh, it's the exact same thing, right? He has rook and two pawns versus two pieces. And so I thought this was uh, somewhat unique and definitely worth showing. Maybe that's why I thought it was the game of the day. I just couldn't resist that they had this sort of unusual material imbalance in two games. Uh, but this position is, uh, is, again, not so easy for the pieces. And it's, uh, it's kind of amazing that Magnus has twice managed to get positions where the the pieces task is pretty difficult. Uh, they make natural moves here for, for a couple moves. Uh, sh surely there's, you know, there's plenty you could analyze here. Um, but we get to this position and uh, things started to go wrong here for, for Hikaru. It seems like he um, he's probably still close to holding. Um, but after, uh, let me show you here. Yeah, in this position, uh, no, this is still okay. C5. So ideally, if black could uh, if black could stabilize with B6, um, they eventually would get a, a beautiful position because the the rook. It's actually, by the way, um, sort of a sort of a tough question to answer. And this was pointed out by a good friend of mine. But how did a white rook get to G6? Right? If you uh, if you had um, a puzzle, how did it happen that this rook got to G6? Because it looks like it jumped over it jumped over something. But anyway, that's a uh, that's a that's just a funny a funny uh, peculiarity of this position. But in theory, black can have a very nice position. So unfortunately, he doesn't quite get there um, because of of tactical reasons. So in order to defend his c pawn, he's forced to move his knight, and now Magnus is just in time to play d6, which transforms the position. Right. So now bishop takes doesn't work because of e5. We've got this uh, nice diagonal here. That's going to be a check. Yeah, exactly. Fuxia in the chat says the Houdini rook. Uh, it is really mysterious how <laughs> that rook ended up on g6. Um, so after d6, um, knight takes d6, rook d5, Magnus is winning his pawn back. And again, he gets one of these positions where the pieces just uh, are not quite as good um, as the combo. So, but it's still, it's still not, it's still not clear. Like I, I think objectively, black is probably still e close to equal. Uh, but it is easier for white to play. And so here, um, Hikaru sort of cracks. I think a queen f6 was really uh, the move that, that allowed the advantage to increase. Uh, but it's not easy to make waiting moves, right? Like it seems like the, the, the computer says the best waiting move is king f6. But that's hard to play. It lets the queen come to f8. You know, it's not so easy. So very understandable. Hikaru plays queen f6. Um, but after rook d7, that trade of... Um, that trade of pawn, uh, indirect trade of pawns, is really in White's favor because the rook now is a super, is a super piece. Um, but now uh, Magnus makes a very nice move, King C2, which forces the bishop to to choose a diagonal. He picks this one, which um, the reason he goes there is to really kind of keep the idea of playing. Uh, Queen to c3 in some variations. And now this is when Magnus had a, a golden opportunity and he had a little bit of time. And uh, I'm sure he regretted the move. You could see on his face, actually, the move that he played, queen d5. Um, he was very upset with himself because after queen takes f3, um, suddenly it's really not clear. Uh, it's an important pawn to lose. And I'm not sure what he intended. He must have, he must have missed that, uh, I don't know, maybe that after queen e5, uh, that there's simply king g8 and the, and the king can stay. Um, I'm not too sure. Because he did have a very strong move at his disposal. And that's the kind of move that he finds um, all the time. And it was rook b8. The threat is simply to play queen f8 with queen g8 checkmate. Um, and it's not so easy to stop. So the most obvious uh, knight d6. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, loses for a couple of reasons, but e5 is the simplest, uh, just forking the, the the queen and knight. Um, and queen d6 is another move, but that one, uh, 
you know, would quickly be assessed as as problematic uh, for for black. It's not clear that it's you know you in a in a uh, in a game you might not be a hundred percent certain that it's totally winning. Um, but actually, I think Magnus would be totally certain that it's winning because the knight the knight is now really bad. Um, so we can play like king d3 and then e5, king e4, king f5. Uh, the knight is really bad, can't come to b7. So um, so this position is just winning for white. So Magnus did have a chance here. But after queen d5, queen takes f3, um, he sees nothing better than repeating. And I think it's just, uh, it's maybe possible to continue to play, but it looks just as dangerous for black as it does for white. Uh, sorry, just as dangerous for white as it does for black. And so it's very natural to just uh, to just say, all right, let me uh, pack my bags and go home. This was not not a bad day for Magnus, uh, not a bad day for Hikaru. Really, um, both players with uh, with a solid result. And keep in mind that in this in this format, the goal is really to um, once you have a couple of wins, you could be happy just making sure you finish in the top eight. And uh, of course, standings will matter for who plays whom in the quarterfinals. Uh, standing standings also matter for how tie breaks are, are done in the quarterfinals. That being said, you know these guys are probably quite happy with their first day. Um, but anything can still happen. Uh, we have two more days of preliminaries. The action will begin again tomorrow. Um, a couple of things I wanted to mention. We have a fantasy chess contest as we always do. Uh, you can follow your results. The results, um, you know, are are being updated as uh, as frequently as we can uh there's going to be another contest if you miss this one there's going to be another contest for the quarterfinals so so stay tuned um and yeah we'll be back we'll be back with more action tomorrow the round robin continues i think magnus had sort of the toughest uh pairings by rating today uh so we'll see if he can keep on keep on rolling uh tomorrow but he had a good day today and um and Hikaru also a very a very good day. He looked he looked good. He played clean uh, clean games, you know, except for the this sort of difficult position that he got against Magnus. He had uh, he played very convincingly. Um, and uh, Wesley So also actually looked really good. Played some solid games. Uh, played well. And Karyakin less obvious just because he had that one checkmate in one, but he's definitely a, a very very strong player. And so we'll we'll see how he continues to do. Um, so. With that, I am going to um, I am going to uh, to wish everybody uh, a good night, and hopefully, I will see everyone tomorrow. Uh, if you have any questions, you know, feel free always to ask uh, ask in the chat. Send me a message. Uh, I am always happy to to answer questions as well. So thanks for tuning in, um, and we will see you tomorrow for the the second day of the Lindoris Abbey Rapid Challenge. Thanks, everybody.